Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, for being here uh, today. Um, my name is uh, Jan Iftimi. I'm uh, uh, an Eisenhower uh, Fellow at the NATO Defense College in uh, Rome. And I uh, also teach uh, uh, emerging technologies uh, occasionally at uh, George Washington University with uh, Professor Karyanis um, over there. And uh, I'm a uh, uh, PhD candidate, not yet uh, PhD. I have another six months uh, to go. Um, and uh, um, my focus of, on my PhD is on, on energy security, primarily critical infrastructure. Uh, but uh, uh, so this, this is still, uh, you know, coming from the military uh, environment, um, I often ignored the aspect of environment, right, environmental sciences and ecology. It's, it wasn't as important to us. So I had, uh, you know, a great opportunity to work with Professor Karyanis at uh, George Washington University who focuses on innovation. Um, and kind of try to push, now you need to look at the environment, you need to incorporate environment into everything that you do. So when I teach, uh, because what I teach is emerging technologies, not only uh, related to, uh, to energy, um, I always try to, to come back to, uh, to, to implement the ecology as well. So here what, what I'm talking about is uh, uh, we're looking at the definition of energy security um, as it's being presented by the International Energy uh, Agency. Uh, and we're pulling in things from the UN, like the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, particularly SDG 7, which has to do with clean energy, um, and identify that there's a disconnect. Uh, and then we apply all of that to uh, innovation and how much, like, you know, money is spent on innovation uh, and how. Uh, governments that are that are focusing on the sustainable development seven, they're not uh, putting enough, uh, let's say, money where where, they're, you know, they've agreed that they will invest in, in innovation for sustainable, for clean energy, but in practice it actually doesn't happen. And then we discuss why. Um, and Dr. Karyanis is uh, is currently in uh, Munich, so he's attending another conference. So it will just be uh, me today talking about this. There you go. So when you talk about energy security, um, the IEA defines it as uh, you, know, you want uh, energy supply that is uh, uh, stable, that is you know, uninterruptible, and reliable. Um, it doesn't talk about uh, sustainability of energy, uh, of energy security. But when you look at predictions over time, uh, you have this in, in industry 4.0, 5.0, there's, there's, there's an energy transformation that's happening that we're in currently where Sustainable Development uh, 7 uh, with the UN, they're trying to enlarge uh, right, the, the, the sustainable uh, energy sources. Now, there's a question there, is, is, is nuclear considered a sustainable development uh, or, or a sustainable energy source. For the purpose of, of this, we haven't included that as, as, a, as, a, as a sustainable um, energy. But I guess that's, that's a debate that, that can be had. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're not really uh, covering that. But as, as we see in the past, we have, uh, right, everything was fuel, coal, oil, natural gases. We're, we're in that, uh, that uh, era of natural gas and we're we're shifting towards uh, sustainable energy sources. Um, there's a big debate now with, uh, with nuclear energy, uh, whether nuclear fusion should be treated differently than nuclear fission. And with a lot of uh, money being uh, uh, spent on uh, technologies to develop um, energy fission, uh, fusion. There you go. So with, uh, with the sustainable development goals that, that were passed in 2015, and, uh, and, and I'll cover that in a minute, there's a lot of challenges when you talk about sustainable energy. We're talking about shifting to sustainable energy, but at the same time, 
we have a phenomenon that's happening worldwide of urbanization. So more and more people are, are moving to, to big cities. And sometimes the energy consumption in these big cities is not always the cleanest. Um, so you have the goals that are being pushed forward by different entities like the United Nations uh, that are you know, fighting with, the, they meet a lot of resistance from, from these different uh, trends that are happening. And one of them is, uh, is urbanization. All right, so I'll, I'll cover what Sustainable Development uh, 7 um, is. So uh, you probably all have, have heard about uh, the Sustainable Development Goals where all governments have gotten together and they've agreed that we have to make progress uh, in, in certain uh, fields. And, and one, the, the one that I'm focusing on is number seven, which has to do with uh, affordable and, uh, and, clean, uh, and clean energy. And uh, what that one is really, I mean, there's, there you go. This is what they're trying to do by, uh, by 2030 is ensure universal uh, access to affordable, reliable, and modern uh, energy services, uh, increase substantially uh, the share of renewable energy uh, in the global energy mix, uh, double the rate of uh, improvement in energy uh, efficiency. And for these, for these three, I'll, I'll go over how, how uh, we've been doing globally in, in, uh, in each of them. But we're also talking about uh, enhancing international cooperation. Uh, to facilitate access to, uh, to clean energy research um, and technology. And our focus, like I've said before, is on innovation. How do you get kids in college, right? So we, we, we've tended in the past, we have people going through the university program, and we're saying that we're teaching them to do innovation. But really, we're not getting them ready for after they graduate, right? So. We've been looking at different, uh, a different way to teach uh, students uh, how to do innovation uh, in particularly the, the energy field, but uh, with the mindset of, uh, uh, of sustainability, which is typically not encouraged uh, when you're applying for, uh, for funds. So when we talk about access to electricity, this is probably globally that we've, we've done uh, the, uh, the best. I mean, they're still in the rural area. They're still, it's, it's to be expected. Access to energy um, is, uh, is a bit lower than, than in the urban uh, uh, environment. Uh, but I mean, we're almost getting to 100% where uh, any urban uh, settings where you have 100% of the people actually having access to electricity. It's not quite 100, but it's, it's in the 90s, which is, is quite impressive. Um, this is something where uh, when you talk about innovation and you look how, how countries spend money, um, one of the indexes that uh, the UN is, is looking at, and this is from the World Health Organization, is whether they're using clean fuel for, for cooking. And you're seeing that this is about 2016. This year is supposed to be about 41%. Um, so 41% uh, percent of the population uh, globally is still not using uh, clean fuel for, for cooking. So, and this is where really innovation comes into play. The reason why this is, is uh, when you talk about Sustainable Development 7, a lot of money are being spent for universities. A lot of money are being given to big entities. But not really to if somebody's trying to, you know, a kid has a has a in, in business school or uh, an engineer has a great idea and wants to start a business um, to, uh, you know, you know, save the environment. There's not a lot of places that they can go to uh, to raise funds. Uh, and me coming from the military perspective and and teaching uh, emerging technologies, I have an easier time uh, getting students that are trying to develop weapon systems. I can find them funds for that very easily. But if they're trying to save the environment and, and build technologies that are uh, eco, you know, environmentally friendly, it's going to be hard for them to find, uh, to find funding, except maybe from private individuals and so forth. But 
uh, if you look at the number of grants on even USA grants, right? Why, would, why where does the U.S. government give spend money? It's it's not going to be so much on the okay, hey, this you know. There's kids that are trying to 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 save the planet and come with new technologies, but when it comes to uh, uh, to using uh, clean technologies and clean fuels, um, this is where um, you know students can really make a difference. Uh, and renewable energy is uh, is another thing where uh, uh, we're making uh, um, pretty uh, pretty good uh, uh, progress. Let me see what. Uh, one um, and this one is uh, has to do with uh, with energy uh, with energy efficiency uh, again the the problem with you know when you when you talk volume the population is increasing dramatically uh, so when uh, you have situations like in Germany which is switching away from nuclear power or and all of a sudden, where are they switching from nuclear power to to uh, to get energy from? Oh, they're switching to coal. So, as I, which one's better, nuclear power or coal, when it comes to uh, uh, to energy efficiency? Um, and this is the model that we're that we're looking at. Uh, particularly, uh, Professor Karyanis has been working on this for uh, for uh, over a decade. Uh, of how we teach students innovation, and then we're putting it back into into what we've just talked about, into sustainable energy, um, and particularly for the for the I, uh, International Energy uh, Agency. So in the past, like you know, you're saying, okay, you're going to get a student in the classroom, and uh, you're gonna you're gonna teach him uh, how to do research and development, right? Um, and then there's a, there's a mode too where where it's moved from it's it's you've got the university setting and then you've got the application setting um, I come from Romania it's their focus is still on this here there's not much uh, like I was born there I, I did you know part of my education there there was n never really this what you see eventually when the triple helix and the focus came here in, in the US where now you have industry government and university working together and trying to to spur innovation a lot of the countries in the world, they're still focusing on this, right? So there's not, you don't have that private, uh, public, and university cooperation uh, to get students to push for, for innovation. Um, and what Professor Karyanis went from, from, from this model, uh, which uh, particularly in the university setting, this one is not so much encouraging um, students who we could say, okay, well, students f f fit into the university uh, science research model, which is not necessarily true. They're just passing through university. Like, you have to consider them as part of society. They come with their own experiences. They, they come with, with uh, which are very valuable. And you have to start incorporating media and society into the model of, uh, of innovation, which was, was, uh, was often uh, ignored. Um, and when we talk about quintuple helix is I, uh, I teach in a business school. And I remember when I, I went through the same business school at uh, George Washington University, um, you know, almost two decades ago. And environment was never covered. I mean, it was like, um, you know, your, your focus is to, is to you know, uh, make your uh, shareholders happy there was really not so much focus on the stakeholders, right? So there was not a lot of focus on this media and society who actually really cares about the environment. So when you're talking about media and society, you also have to add the, the environment piece out there. And even though um, a lot of the, in, in, the um, in the corporate world, people may argue, well, you know, it's important. We're going to put it on on our flyers, but we're you know, it's it's we're not really going to put a lot of focus on it. If you don't, and it comes out that you know you have you've been you're not environmentally friendly, you can lose a lot of reputation. So it does have a weight. It's not the most important thing, right, to to shareholders, but it's something that they consider, especially if it's going to uh, lead to a loss of uh, income for them. 
right? So this is uh, how the, the, you know, Professor Karyanis went through like the different cycles and uh, trying to explain uh, uh, mode three um, that it's not so much uh, a linear uh, model and uh, also looking at uh, particularly when, uh, when you're talking about civil society and you're starting to integrate civil society into educational models, um, you have to look at uh, democracy of knowledge and uh, democratic capitalism. Um, so I like, this is one of the ones that I like because it gets, puts in a perspective, particularly how innovation happens. And you've got a political system which, which, which helps right the innovation. You got the, the research and development uh, system and you've got the economic system and you see that there's, a, there's an overlap over there. You've got the education system and you see that there's, a, there's an overlap there between the education system and the research and development system. I guess you could argue that you know, if, if it's a private university, do you, do you consider it economic? You know, but, and, and then the, how you know, innovation kind of fits um, within, within that. And trying to kind of move away from this linear, right? It's like, okay, well, students come in, they, they come to the university, uh, they do research and development, they start a business, and, you know, kind of, it's a simplistic way of doing it. This is how innovation happens. And, you know, realizing that this is more of a circular model in the sense that, you know, it's always good to have people go out, they work in a business, whatever, and they have the pra practical experience, and to have them back into the classroom to interact again with the students and get them to kind of like that practical knowledge. Uh, because a lot of the professors have, have never really worked in a, in a private world. They've, they've just done academic world. And, and it's a way to, for, for both the professors to learn, but also for the students when they come to the classroom to see from the practical experience of, uh, of practitioners so to speak. And it's kind of how we move all the way from, right, the mode one, uh, mode two is what, what kind of I've, I grew up with in, in Romania into a quintuple helix, which in, in a lot of countries, at, at best, you get to the triple helix. Uh, civil society is really not important. We don't care what the people, care, what the people think. Um, and, uh, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, it's, it's, that's kind of how how it is in, in a lot of countries, not most, but a lot is still, it's still like that. And uh, uh, civil society has a lot more weight, um, even in those countries that think we're only gonna limit, we're not really gonna listen to the, to the people. But then at the end of the day, you see that there's a revolution, that there's right, things are happening that are forcing governments to start considering that quadruple helix um, and eventually the you know, quintuple helix is where probably much more here with civil society. I guess there's a lot of fake news now. There's a lot of things in the news now that is like, okay, well, is, is climate change real? And you see that there's a lot of people out there that still believe that climate change is not real. It's, it's all a hoax and uh, well, you know, it's, so we're not here yet, but this is what we're trying to push, to push uh, forward. Um, and then kind of put it in the context of, uh, right, innovation and uh, uh, with, with uh, particular sustainable innovation and kind of how knowledge uh, moves from, from one uh, system to, to another, right? So you've got a, a law that, that passes, it's being pushed and you, know, you, you have that, uh, you know, the educational system is, is picking that up. It's like, okay, how do we teach that? Uh, and that, you know, leads to knowledge and economic system. Um, you know, where specifically uh, then uh, if they are environmentally friendly, right, that knowledge can, uh, can lead to, right, you got the natural environment and natural capital uh, that's being picked up by the media or by civil society and being promoted, hey, this is a great example, uh, particularly successful cases, um, and it kind of goes into a cycle like that. So, um, so then we're trying to, put all that theoretical knowledge that in, we're teaching in university and how do you apply it to sustainable development uh, goal seven with, with the UN in particular and also uh, how do you apply it um, 
to, um, to the definition that the International uh, Energy uh, Agency has for energy security, which focuses so much on reliability and a lot less on sustainability. Right, so um, the focus in everything that we do, uh, particularly as we move in the future, when we talk about energy security, we have to make sure that it's, it's not separated from sustainable energy. Um, and what we're pushing for is for the International Energy Agency to just add that one word when they define energy security, which is sustainable, right? I mean, there could be, um, uh, right, arguments of what is sustainable and what not, and, uh, but we're not, we're not so much focused on that. It's just the idea that, uh, the, you know, later if you go on the International Ag Energy Agency, they, did, they do talk about, okay, well, we need to be responsible about the environment, right? But it's not the same as putting it in a definition, which is that one line, which highlights the fact that we also have to be environmentally friendly. Uh, and again, this comes from the fact that, that, that civil society has to be listened to and, uh, and you know, not just the desire for profit um, and, um, and so forth. And this is an example, um, I guess I, uh, I compressed the presentation for size so uh, it lost a little bit of the, of the graphics. But the uh, um, European Union has done really good at adopting uh, a lot of these uh, goals that we're pushing for the International Energy uh, Agency um, and actually make sure that when they're talking about energy security, they talk about sustainability. So. And that's, yeah, I guess it, it, did, it did mess up a little bit, uh, yeah, so, but that's good. So yeah, so that's, that's what I've, sure. Yeah, so if, if you look, those are like uh, the research and innovation landscape, which again, we're, we're looking at, uh, at innovation and how the European Union is, is spending uh, funds. So, we have in the U.S. like we have like grants.gov. The European Union has its own uh, um, uh, place where you can actually look for grants where they where they're willing to to spend money on. Um, and you see that th there's a lot of them. When you're talking about, you see a lot more uh, energy comes up a lot in the types of funds that uh, that they do. Um, climate change, a lot of things that have to do with. Uh, um, you know, infrastructures, but um, particularly energy and climate change uh, is, is front and center, and particularly the environment comes out. Everything has to be envir environmental friendly. Uh, and a lot of the requests for when you apply for funds, if you can show that, it's, uh, that your plan is, doesn't help the environment either. It's, it's less likely that, that they'll look at you for, for receiving those funds. So, and that's why I had this, uh, this put up over here. Uh, this is very different too, because if you look at, uh, at the na uh, nations, uh, nations, like within the European Union, it doesn't mean that the nations in the European Union are doing better than the U.S. That's, that's actually not, not correct at all, really. I mean, we're doing so much better than individual nations in, uh, um, in Europe in promoting, a lot of them, in promoting uh, environmental uh, friendly uh, solutions. But at the EU, at, at the EU level as an institution, they, they're very environmentally friendly and they've been pushing for all these nations individually to adopt more environmentally friendly solutions. So. Exactly. Renewable portfolio standards, the ways in which utility companies are required to change what they 
do. Right. So, um, we That's might measure it by something political like system, or right? Or gas price. So, the, the other thing is where are groups like the Rock Mountain Institute who apply politics? Right. Uh, given the training the utility companies, how to do that? Right. Yeah, so that's where we talk about civil society. That's, that's you know, the, you, you've got all those NGOs and all those think tanks that can actually contribute to, to innovation. And that's why, that's why Professor Karyanis, when he looked at the model, is like, okay, it's not enough to look at, right, you've got the private, you've got the government, you've got academia, and that was the, 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 the triple helix system. They're not separate, they're integrated. So Correct. They're yeah, that's why there's there's a lot of there's a lot of, uh, but they, they don't coincide. For example, with a group, right? So instead of putting the the think tank, I mean, think tank sometimes can be right. You've got government, and you've got private, but you also it's not just the triple helix, right? It goes beyond it. So that's where it's the civil society, and it, it's still in most of the, or a lot of the think tanks are still NGOs, and that's kind of we we treated them as as being. Uh, as, as part of the civil society and a little bit separate. They still have a lot of the same goals, right? There's still, there's levels of, uh, they're not completely separate, and I think we're... Well, they're definitely not separate. Right, exactly, yes, exactly. So let me see what the uh, best representation of that would be. Right, so there's a lot of levels of, uh, of uh, interaction together. I mean, I guess probably not the best model, but we have like different type of graphics that we're playing with. It's like how to explain the model, but it's not, they're not separate entities, right? There's always like a uh, level of uh, uh, interconnection where, where, you know, we look at them in, in together. So, and this is, this is the model we're looking at. I mean, it, it could be, could be wrong. And actually, I, I do appreciate your comments too, because that's something that I'll find back to. Part so it's uh, business students, poli sci students, but it's also uh, students that are studying the IT technologies and building the the next generation of whether it's the Nest system that you control, you know, smart right. systems for for controllers that can be sold to consumers. So that's there is a market happening there for some of that too. Yes. How do universities help inspire those kinds of companies? Right. So I Thank have, you. I have several questions. Go ahead. Can you go back to the to the model that you had with squares and that one? Yeah. <laughs> it seemed to me that you captured some very important kind of things in this model that don't come across in the other model. That you have to have a political system that really fosters kind of freedom in thinking and, and spontaneous kind of environment. And you right. have to have your um, an economic system that fosters that too. So it looked to me like this model then had some foundation kind of things in it that come across where the, the helix mo model does not capture that. Because right. Because everything looks equal in that model and in this model it comes across more as there's some foundation kind of things that help that's a very good it. point yeah that's that's a very good point yeah thank you because i mean i just continue to be amazed at how innovative the country is well, it, it, that's it's. I mean, that's where I think the idea of focusing more on civil society and, and accepting that you know that students before they come to college they have a lot of value when it comes to innovation, and we tend to ignore that. that they can like, you know they can especially they may have they may be very IT savvy, and they can actually come up with some solutions where they actually make a difference in the private industry um, just because they bring that knowledge uh, with them, and so. I don't think we looked so much as at measuring which one is more important and assigning like, you know, okay, a, a quantification to it, but kind of just recognizing that, you know, it should be. 
So our universities relevant. are going very heavily into online kind of systems yes. versus being in present and working in face-to-face -face kind of communications. Right. Has there been any work on, on looking at what fosters innovation more, whether you have an on-campus kind of environment or an online environment? Yeah, I think I mean, we're, we've been looking at that too. Actually, um, two days ago, I went to a, uh, it's not, a, it's a workshop more than a conference at the uh, Italian embassy that they had it on virtual reality and how that can potentially change some of these challenges that you have with online education or right, bringing people together and being able to actually, you know, have the more reality aspect was like well, collaboration if you, if you immerse, immerse yourself into the, virtual reality realm. So that may be something that may bring people together too. It's like, to your point, one, so I come, you know, I, I was doing a critical infra uh, infrastructure security from the military side. So we're reacting with like if there's a cyber attack, right, to critical infrastructure, how do you react to it? So from the military perspective, we've always had the challenges like working with the civilian sector. Now it's, we're doing a lot better in the US than for example in other places in Europe. but. How do you bring people together to work better together? And that's what we're hoping that virtual reality, because you don't always have the mobility or the ability to, to send people to locations. Maybe virtual reality can help people collaborate more, more uh, between the, the different circles, right? If you had the, the government and then the industry uh, and then academia eventually using it for, for teaching um, and so forth. So, but. Yeah, I, I think virtual reality may uh, may make a difference in that eventually. So, Can you go ahead. I guess clarify uh, what you mean by the sort of like an environmental system, because in terms of the other systems, there's actually active players, right? You know, yes. people can make conscious decisions to yes. promote innovation. But how does the environment? Do so this is exactly this is a very good point because this is where we uh, right you talked about size that we should probably like there's there's really it sh it's not so accurate to have everything the same size right because um, and is the environment its own system or is it just part of the the right civil society uh, in a way pushing forward as like hey we, we environment is important for us. So when you're talking about stakeholders, right, um, where are the, who are the stakeholders for the environment? They're, you know, probably like more, more accurate to have like the quadruple uh, system as opposed to a quintuple one. Um, so the, we added the quintuple one just because it, there's, there's the shift that when you talk about innovation in business schools, it's like they're pushing for, is this environmentally friendly? Um, so then we, can, we, we said, okay, we gotta take it seriously. We gotta put, put it in its own category. But you're absolutely right. It doesn't fit so much with, uh, when it comes to stakeholders. Or you gotta talk, can we consider trees as being you know, stakeholders or, right? So, but, uh, but yeah, good. That's something that you know, I've been challenged too. I was introduced to this model as well as kind of where. You could almost nest the quadruple helix inside the environment. Yeah, so we, we, we looked at that, yeah, different, we played with different. Because um, in terms of innovation, there's a lot of different objectives, right? You right. Know, you want high quality of life, environment being one of them, sort of jobs and whatnot. And so I, I see environment as just sort of a new objective from the quadruple helix that people care about. Okay. That's a good point. No, 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 that's a good point because I'll, I'll take this back. This is something that I'm using for my, uh, for my dissertation too, so this is actually helping me out a lot. <laughs> there's a there's a tremendous amount of literature on sustainability, sustainability education, right? And often sustainability programs in business schools now also adopt the triple bottom line, the three E's: energy, environment, economics, and the intersection of we cannot have any solutions, appropriate technology right. policies right, that right. do not understand those dimensions. So. How does that literature coincide with this? Again, that would be the then the three intersecting, and that's that's well a good uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. Let me. Uh, um. Um, 
And, and teaching the triple bottom line now it has been institutionalized. And right. I would um, point you to AISHI, American Association of Sustainability in Higher Education, right. and their efforts over almost a decade now uh, to get this into all kinds of programs, whether it's liberal arts to design early programs, or et cetera. So I think that there's a lot, again, that's also being integrated internationally. Right. Yeah, now, and this is, this is something that's been uh, quite of a challenge. I have another presentation later today, but it's more on the military side, where you're talking about energy security, you're talking about cybersecurity, why do we care about climate? And how do you bring, why, why, why should DOD care about the environmental aspects, right? As you bring the three E's, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's there, we're, we're talking about it, but do we actually put it in practice? Yeah, so I think my challenge is, is um, how do you bring the environment into everything that we do? Uh, I've got kids, and for me, it's important that you know, with, with climate change that's happening, with everything else, like I want them to experience the same beauty of nature that I have uh, growing up. So, I think maybe environment is too important for me, and maybe that's why I'm trying to bring it back uh, into everything that I do. Um, but, but yeah. So yeah, thank you for that. That's, I'll look into that because I think that may help with me making my case about why environment is so important. We have to bring it into mm -hmm. these models. Thank you. One of the really simple things that you talked about in reality is the fact that, and it's shocking to me, that there's still so much done with, um, with cooking. And I mean, there's been solar cookers out here, I mean, uh, trying to push the solar cookers and that kind of thing. And so if the world has not taken this innovative kind of thing that is sustainable, et cetera, um, why is it that that kind of thing hasn't caught on in, in, in whatever parts of the world that are still not using uh, sustainable cooking kind of thing? Well, I think there's, so I have an experience in, uh, I used to be an infantry out. My first part of the military was infantry, and I went to Iraq and uh, during the surge in 2006, 2007. And they didn't have electricity. Their, their power grid was all down, and so it's like, how do you innovate? It's like, well, you could, sometimes the idea is, okay, well, we're going to push in these technologies coming in, but they never actually end up getting to the people. That's, they, they never reach them. Right, this innovative technologies. You have to focus on local innovation. So what we did and what actually worked in, in those areas after they haven't had electricity for four years is I ended up finding that there's engineers, like college graduates, very smart kids, but they were still living in Baghdad. They were engineers. So you find engineers, you find people that are willing, that, that can run uh, uh, generators, for example, and we started bringing uh, medium-sized generators that would power, you know, 20 houses. And you find somebody in those 20 houses that can actually operate the generator, fix it if there's a problem. But, but you have to rely on local solutions mm -hmm. and on local knowledge. And if you're relying on local solutions and local knowledge, you have to push innovation forward. And I think innovation, local innovation is much more important than, hey, we have uh, solar cookers, we can push them into all these countries. And it's like, well, that's a great idea, but can you maybe push the know-how in those countries and, and see what, the, what, what these communities have? And right, go back to that civil society, and maybe they can, right, maybe there's some NGOs out there, maybe there's, that can help the local communities come up with innovative solutions that work for them. And then what you have, the end result is, those, uh, you know, a version of the solar cookers, right? And on that note, I'd just like to piggyback on there, and I know of a family in Bolivia who's, who runs a farm in the countryside. Only one of nine sisters is still there. She has a, a solar-powered uh, cell phone, and she's very motivated to have that technology, even though she has a clay stove for cooking, uh, which her father built. She's motivated because she wants to stay connected to all of her brothers and sisters around the world. So they brought in that technology 
and she wants to keep it going. So that local know-how and local motivation, I think, like you said, is important. Yeah, local I mean, know-how. It's I, I work with a lot of NGOs that, uh, like, for example, there's one in uh, Nicaragua that uh, they're trying to, in a plantation, there's a lot of inaccessible terrain. It's like, ha but they use motorcycles. Like, well, they you just look at the local in innovation where now they have a motorcycle and they add this little carriage at the end of the uh, motorcycle because now they can carry, you know, whatever they grow, like the farmers can now carry that for a certain distance. But that's innovation, like local something where, you know, maybe we don't think about it here. We're not going to export things to Nicaragua with those in there. Like they take what they have and they know what their needs are and they adapt what they have to their needs. And you have to trust that. And the education is very important. That's why in, like when you enable somebody to, to make a difference, they will make a difference and they will improve their lives as, as, as well as a result of that. So I think that's what we're looking at with uh, right, the, the idea that you know, we don't have to ignore the civil society. And then we added that environment separate because we look at it different. Like a civil society is, is the people that the stakeholders that can actually make that difference. And then the environment is like, maybe like you said, it maybe it should be the larger part is the environment. Who knows, maybe when we do space exploration, then you have the space over the environment for uh, Right, to avoid all this debris that we're leaving out in the outer space. You, know. you talk about creating an innovation ecosystem, but um, I guess, do you have any thoughts on what metric to use to track? Like, are we implementing something? Is it making a system more innovative or not? Like, any thoughts on so how to track? So, there's, there's different uh, innovation indexes out there that we're, we've looked at um, that are pretty good. Um, um, Rather than pushing for our own, I think Princeton has, has a pretty good one. Um, uh, I think the GII, the Global Innovation Index, or something like that. And uh, um, can we pick one and then add to it? Uh, or can we uh, can we assign? Because, uh, like Mary, I think you were saying about uh, you know, there's there's more weight on certain ecosystems than others. Can you start, if you look at those indexes, and these indexes also use about 80 other indexes that they derive from, right? But then they're not so much, right, they, they use an average or some, right? So can you change the way that they calculate their big index? Uh, more on, right, you, you get these 80 indexes, you kind of put each of them within a, a helix um, and uh, and then you, you assign a weight for each helix. But then if you look at each nation's, I mean, because cultures are different. So cultures dictate what the weight is going to be. So then how do you calculate that for the different countries, the weight of the different indexes? What will actually make a difference, right? Because some countries are more, you know, innovation comes more from top down. Other countries is more from bottom up. Um, so. That's there's a challenge, yeah. There's, of course, incredible tension between innovation and environment. It's not yes. all, so hydrofracking technology is an incredible oh, innovation. Oh, yeah. But what is it, it's spurring the problem. Yeah, so, so that's, I mean, that's where, you know, the, the idea of like, when you look at innovation, I mean, it's putting the environment there is not necessarily, it doesn't make it easier, right, to, to innovate. It makes it maybe a little bit harder sometimes. So whoever writes the metrics puts their values in there. Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of subjectivity that's involved in this, and that's what I was saying. I mean, I can come up with my own knowledge and culture behind me, and I think this is the right way to do it, but somebody coming from a different culture will have a different way of weight, like putting the weights is like what's, what's important. Like for me, if I didn't have the experiences in Iraq, for example, like looking at how people innovate, I wouldn't think the way that I do now where I put a lot more value to things that are coming from the bottom up as opposed to, hey, we're gonna spend some money at this uh, uh, big think tanks or uh, big uh, companies and hope that something good is gonna come out of it. It's like I'm trying to focus more as like we're not spending enough to those little people that, that can actually come with some great ideas 
and they may have a great idea, but it doesn't go anywhere. They don't have the opportunity to innovate. So how do you enable them to innovate at the lower levels? So to have that bottom-up innovation. So. I just thought it'd be fascinating if there was some indices and venues for compared. If you don't include the environment versus including the environment, do we actually over project that we're actually innovating if you're not considering the environment? Or if you have this new index that considers the environmental weights, how does that change? I, I just I mean, feel it would make more of a from a private selling. from a private perspective too. Environment, cybersecurity, even um, is a cost. Right, so cybersecurity is even even. Uh, well, I know it's not so much related to this, but it's it's so stark and so obvious that you go to a private company a lot of times, and they're like, "Oh, do you have a cybersecurity uh, uh, division?" It's like, "No, it's I've never been hacked." It's like, how do you know? But then the real reason is that it takes a lot of money to set that up, which brings their net profit down, which means that the bonus for the CEO goes down. So you have a lot of CEOs saying, you know, well. I'll let the next guy figure it out. I mean, it's probably not as, not as relevant when you talk to, to, to the environment, but it can be because, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not environmentally conscious and you're not spending a little bit more money on, on the right pipes or the right uh, pumps or right, and then you have an event, you know, like a, a, a disaster that's an environmental disaster, then it's going to affect on the brand of your company. So... Yeah, you, maybe you should spend that cost on, on, on being environmentally friendly. But again, it's, you're talking stakeholders and you have to always fight for, right, justify what's important and that's... Well, there aren't easy solutions either. Yeah, so, so that's why... Uh, spending money, the greatest intentions in the world, when you're at the, for example, county planning level, yes. it's very difficult. The barriers from the technological to the cultural and you know, people don't necessarily agree on the absolutely. Right path oh, absolutely. So institutions and decision making really complicate this notion of how do we do what we want to do, which is clean energy. And so that I'm not sure again that how this is going to help us at that level, um, thinking about energy security and not just as a development issue, but our own development. What, as we are trying to transition to the next energy system. Well, that's, it's, it's, it's to, to that point, for example, when I have my interactions with the Department of Defense, and I don't, if I, if I knock on the door and I say, hey, let's meet at the Pentagon to talk energy security, and if I say, let's talk energy security and the environment, they'll, they'll say, oh yeah, because they're on the phone with me or whatever. It's like, yeah, let's, let's meet, and then a couple of weeks later, I'll get an email, oh, by the way, I can't make it. Right. But if I go in and I say, um, hey, let's, let's have a meeting with, uh, to talk about energy security, because my focus is cyber, and I say, yeah, with, with cyber threats to, to energy infrastructure and so forth, you, they go like, and I go, there's no problem. The, the meeting doesn't get canceled, right? So there's, there's within organizations, there's, there's a different focuses, and you have to recognize what these focuses are. Um, but it doesn't mean that because their focus may not necessarily be energy uh, sustainability, it doesn't mean that they're not interested in it. It just means that it's not maybe not a priority as high enough for them to take time and actually discuss this and discuss projects in the future. But if you bring it uh, and, and you, you, you bring that, uh, that, energy, that, that environmental, the sustainability aspect within other issues that are priority for them, then you, you see that it's very successful. It's, I think media has been very, uh, uh, like even with uh, right, President Trump saying, okay, we're getting out of, uh, 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 of the Paris Agreement. And everybody says, okay, U.S. doesn't care about the environment. I don't think that's necessarily true. Right? So there's other reasons why that happens that I think are, are more important. It doesn't mean that now because you can't really talk anything environment with the administration because they're not going to listen. But it may not be the priority, but if you bring it in within other type of, uh, of efforts that is a priority, then they will listen about it. So I think there's a lot of re reasonable understanding. I, I don't know if that kind of helps. It's the same thing with businesses is in like understanding what they want, understanding what they're trying to achieve. And if you're trying to push something on them, 
finding a way to say this is important to you within the context of what their priorities are, so, which is a challenge, like you said. Yes. You showed a diagram about energy efficiency, and it was going down. Yes. Can you discuss that? Because, you know, you, you really think that being energy efficient is of a, a value, and so I would think that maybe an energy efficiency, maybe coal was more energy efficient than um, this is not natural gas down. or it's something. So it was this is it's measuring something else. Yeah, yeah. It's energy it's intensity. Right? Yeah, it's the energy intensity of the craft. The title is yeah. misleading. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I think this is probably a better aspect of like renewable energy. Um, but yeah, this is going much more because you're talking, uh, you know, populations going up. So it's 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 calcula calculating uh, compared to um, to the GDPs. So total, yeah. So yeah, I think this is probably a, a more accurate. But no. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but I think I look I look at this when it, when I look at innovation. I think you know. The, the fact that, you know, 41% of the global population is still using unclean fuels for cooking. Well, is, we use natural gas. Is that not an unclean Yeah, I was just curious. Fuel? Well, um, and some movement to get off gas is something we are trying so to So, again, this is the World Health Organization, and I think they, uh, you know, they actually consider natural gas as part of the clean aspect. So, it's cleaner for, for public health in terms of... Um, Lung injuries, you want to get off of smoky to clean or burning, but, but you're not also clean in the other sense. and then it also too. depends on how it's right, how the natural gas has been exploited. Like you were saying, if it was fracking, like are we taking you know the, the environmental effects of fracking itself? Is that counted within this? And it's not, I actually think this is mainly sort of burning oil, so, yeah. Yeah. that's what I was right, right. thinking that it was yeah. burning oh. wood. Well, it's it's more for cooking. So yeah, burning wood. So you have the coal. Um, you also have uh, in Iraq. They, everybody would use propane, right? So you would have the the propane gas. I mean, um, is that uh, you know? Was that considered not clean? I think that's considered more not clean than. Uh, okay. Just from. People, uh, I, know, I know people who've worked on clean cook stove, and for them, carbon is not really the main driver. It's about the particulate matter yeah. for, for yeah. health. Yeah. So, but it's interesting. I mean, that's, that's my challenge. My challenge is how do I bring the environment in what I do? Um, and especially, I, I do my, my PhD in the uh, Department of Envi Environmental Sciences, and I talk about energy security and cybersecurity, and everybody's looking at me, why are you here? So, yeah. There's a group called Appropriate Technology Collaborative out of Michigan, and they do capacity building in country, teaching women to build their own solar panels and micro wind. So it's local knowledge, but also uh, literally teaching them how to build simple, but uh, reliable for them, interruptible perhaps. But right. I mean, this is. This is something that universities are doing and taking students down there to also get the experience of helping build and learning at the same time about um, sustainable development. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, there's, a, there's a program the Department of Energy is, uh, is running too, right, where uh, you have a lot of the environment, or a lot of departments that are doing engineering trying to build houses and build sustainable houses. So they go and they build their own so models and they, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's uh, that's pretty impressive that uh, what they do and then they. But they're in direct them. collaboration with universities on many of these. So I think that right. there's, there's a lot of a lot of evidence and, and examples you can use, you can draw from. I, I agree and I, and I think more um, to my challenge, because I, when I bring in cybersecurity and cybersecurity in the environment, and nobody wants to talk about that. So, and my uh, my focus is like when I bring there's been cyber attacks like in in uh, uh, that you know have led to uh, spills 
and you know that then you know even if it's a minor effect on the environment, it's there, and you have to talk about it. So, but cyber is an issue for like solar panels, right? So, is there any work going on about trying to make the the standard ones more cyber secure? No, I'm 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 completely with you, but but it's not a it's not a, it, it's it's. Uh, uh, when I bring things like that, particularly protecting renewable energy, uh, right? So again, it still has to do but with innovation. It's not regulated at the state level, so bringing it to the national agencies, they are not going. It's the actions of the states. Oh, and and yes, I have stories about that too, where you know you have now a Department of Defense who has to who has responsibility on protecting a lot of this critical infrastructure, um, but then because they're regulated at the state level. National Guard has, may have access immediately to react to it, but the federal government doesn't. So unless they have like signature from the governor and uh, direct to get access to, to the private files of, of an entity when it's being attacked, uh, which significantly can slow down the response of the government um, to, uh, to an attack against critical infrastructure. So those are more like organizational challenges that we've done a lot better tackling them. It's not so much a challenge today as, as it has been in the past, but we've learned the hard way, actually, being attacked and then realizing that it takes us so long to actually react and figure out what's going on because you don't actually have access to the private data. And then you have to go through hoops to get access to the private data to see and analyze it, to see who's attacking you. Who, I mean, it's, and, uh, you mean private data of the utility? Of the utility company, yeah. So, but but it has to do with what you're talking about because they're regulated at the state level. There, you know, I think we're doing much better now at uh, you know dealing because we've run through it, we've run through this challenge before, so we've found ways to to increase the speed of reaction. Um, I'm at the NATO Defense College now, and I'm trying to do the same thing that we've learned from the lessons learned that we've done here in the U.S can we get our allies in Europe to start adopting some of the same, you know, ways of, of reacting to, uh, to cyber attacks against critical infrastructure in particular, which is much more of a challenge over there than it is here. So, because it's much more bureaucratic. So, yeah. One of the things that we've thought about is the fact that when we have cyber attacks, most places, especially in the utility, in the electric power areas, they try to hide it so that people don't know that they've had this cyber attack. And I've thought There's a good that reason for it, but yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, no, sorry, I didn't mean to No, try. but it seems to me that, that if there was more open reporting so that everybody could share what was that situation, how do we fix it, etc., that we'd be, we'd call it more to the attention of the public so that they would be willing to say, okay, yes, I don't want to have this happening to, whether it's electric power or water or, you know, that you don't want it to happen, so therefore you'd be willing to pay a little more. But by not making it visible, you don't bring that, that civil society along with the issues that you may be having. Right, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very good, uh, very good observation. I mean, that's part of the reason why they're not, you know, a lot of cybersecurity is like, uh, vulnerabilities are not being shared is a lot of times for especially like infrastructure it may take a very long time for them to get fixed so you have a lot of technologies out there particularly uh, when, when you talk about uh, the grid substations and so forth mm -hmm. that are completely vulnerable mm -hmm. and they have to be it's not like oh I'm gonna change one or two pieces in it and fix the, the problem now I and mean, they have to be changed like the entire substations right so when you're talking about that's that's a significant amount of investment that yes, has to be done. and therefore, I think the public would be more willing to say, yes, increase my monthly bill because this is happening. Because they don't tell you, therefore people 
don't want their energy costs to go up. Well, I think, I think the information that they're vulnerable is out there, right? So that's not a secret. That, I think the specific vulnerability is like, you know, they, the, 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 the desire or the need for, you know, keeping this secret is so much more on what's the exact vulnerability that, uh, right, so those that go, when you go into specificity, however, when, because there was a, an early, like the earlier comment about technology and, and young people can come up and, and come up with solutions, how do you enable this, right, so we're, we're doing better at, at government and private working together, at, at sharing information, we do exercises together uh, and, and, and when it comes to critical infrastructure, right? But how do you get the academia to be part of it? How do you get the civil society and that bottom up, right? Because maybe there's a brilliant programmer out there that can come up with some brilliant solutions. Like, how do you get him, like, you know, how banks used to do it? There's like, hey, if you can hack my, my bank, I'll give you a certain amount of money if you tell me how, how you did it, right? It's like, how do you transition where you bring civil society and when you bring academia into being able to develop solutions to the problems that we're facing? And like you're saying, lack of transparency is also part of the, the reason why there's not enough collaboration between all the different entities like you know government academia private sector and we also society. don't want to scare the public right. and there's that we yes. also don't want to invite our students to hack the substation yes next um, so we do training though i mean so it's it's uh you know, that's a great solution of getting inviting academia into all these different training events where only the you know it's I mean, it, it, it is a philosophical sort of discussion because you know there is if we're transparent about our problems we might be able to invite solutions but at the same time you're also inviting other people you're telling people your vulnerabilities and so there's a trade-off there and, and for critical infrastructure systems that's probably a risk that people don't want to take yeah. whereas if it was like offline IT systems yeah that, you know you can sort of sandbox it and Right. People can play exactly. it. So yes. it's, it's a different problem yes. when it comes to criminal. It should be transparent There's to the regulators, not to the public. There's a right. systematic way to do penetration tests and you have non-disclosure agreements, white hat hackers. Yeah. It takes six months uh, for a big organization. Right, but and those are contained information contained. you don't advertise it yeah. to everyone, right? You're like, oh, but, you and, but again, it's like you, you, you don't necessarily have, you have people that are participating that have an interest in it. But you may have people that are very competent and could really make a difference, but they never think about taking that route. How do you bring them into into providing solutions? Thanks, professionals. Yeah. I don't know if this is helpful. Just you were talking about academia, and and we've done a lot of work with community-based participatory research. So the same kind of thing. How do you bring community members who are from marginalized groups, who don't usually come into academic spaces, right? Who can tell you from the ground up what they need, what their exactly. problems are. Yes. Um, and what I think a piece that's sometimes missing is if you're a researcher and you just say, oh, I just need 20 people who have this experience, how do I recruit them? Then they all come in as individuals who don't have any power in the conversation and they stay to do a year of research and then they leave and you haven't actually built anything sustainable for them and you haven't actually come as equals, you've come as Yes. an institution that has power and is organized and then you've worked with individuals. So what we found is really helpful is if you find like the community organizers or the okay. brokers or the people who know the community and know how to connect you with people but who can also, if you build trust with those people and you build longer sustainable connections, then you have an ongoing connection with them. You can trust them to know, you know what, your, what the risks are about or, or your sort of limitations as for us academicians and you know for as far as energy goes you can kind of bring them into the inner circle potentially and then have longer relationships with them and then kind of connect when you need to to broader groups and that for us has been helpful and I don't know if there's some parallels here I think it's a lot easier to do that uh, in the US per, per, perhaps more than outside like uh, in a lot of the poor communities and like you go to Africa you go to the Middle East you um, you have to consider certain stake, like you know, stakeholders that may be like very influential, but they're also very corrupt. Mm -hmm. And and you know, how do you work with them? And a lot of the organizations are not willing to to work with them. Oh no, it's like we've heard they're really corrupt, so we're not going to work with them. But then, because you're not working with them, then nothing happens at the at the ground level because they control everything. So, it's 
you know, so there's, you go back to philosophical dilemmas where are we going to sacrifice part of our moralities to make a difference or are we going to stick to our morals and let these people continue suffering because we can't get access to, to them because we're not willing to work with certain people. So that's just a good thought, I guess. So but completely agree with you 110%. And thank you all. I think are we are we done with time wise or we got five minutes? Five minutes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.